looking at um, how we manage first presentations, um, looking at some of the challenges that you might face uh, um, from a district general, from a local point of view, um, and especially probably the one that comes up again and again is how do we manage edema? And if we've got time and uh, you haven't all left, we can do a case study at the end. Or hopefully we'll try and do some interaction. Um, so just looking at, first of all, is how do we actually define nephrotic syndrome? So if I give you a quick 20 seconds, just to quickly, um, how do we actually, what is nephrotic syndrome? What are the three things we have to have to define something as someone as having nephrotic syndrome? Yeah, so number one, always going to be the um, obvious one that draws people to seeing a, a GP or a doctor is um, edema. Someone looking puffy and then someone put a low albumin, yeah, and proteinuria. So the definition of nephrotic syndrome is that triad. It's a proteinuria. We talk about three plus on your analysis, four plus on your analysis. Um, by definition, it's more than 300 milligrams per millivolts on an albumin to creatinine ratio. Some of you will do protein to creatinine ratios, which are similar. Um, it's hyperalbumin, so albumin of less than 25, and edema. So you have to have all three of them. When we talk about it in the context of children and uh, childhood nephrotic syndrome, um, we talk about it being idiopathic. So we talk about nephrotic syndrome as almost a diagnosis in and of itself. And that's usually because there isn't anything else that's causing it, whereas an adult often has another cause to it. Um, some of the atypical features, though, are really important to consider when you're looking at children. Is there something else causing that nephrotic syndrome or is it just um, an idiopathic? And the really important ones are probably looking at age. So definitely if they're less than 12 months of age, um, really should be considering is there something else causing this nephrotic syndrome? The upper limit is slightly more grey. Um, We've definitely had teenagers that have responded like an idiopathic nephrotic syndrome, um, obviously some younger children that don't. Um, we tend to talk about 12 being our upper age limit. I know some places use 10 though. Uh, other atypical features, definitely macroscopic yeah. hematuria. There shouldn't be any children, uh, children presenting yeah. with, um, with large amounts of blood in their urine. It is quite typical to find microscopic um, so looking at um, plus, two plus, and sometimes three plus of blood on dipstick, that can be quite normal in the process. If they've got a persistently high um, creatinine, um, sometimes you'll get it in the context of in the drive and they present. But if it's persistently high, that is an atypical feature for the childhood and should be considered. Um, if they're hypertensive, um, hypertension is one of those difficult to manage, difficult to um, confirm, but definitely if they're above their 95th percentile on more than one occasion, so not just the one off, but if it's persistently hypertensive. And that's usually before you start. Can I just ask if you can mute your um, microphone? Thank you. Um, if there's a slow onset of disease, so we'll talk about a typical presentation, but if there's been a long history and perhaps it's been picked up not because they presented because they're edematous, but perhaps um, that borderline serum album, low serum albumin is picked up on a blood test that's done for another reason. Um, if they've got lower ranges of protein you're in, so it is three plus, but perhaps lower end or even the two plus to three plus. And just if they've got a long history of um, being edematous, they've had puffy eyes. And parents say, well, they've had puffy eyes for months sometimes. If they look syndromic, it's probably quite an obvious one. And then just thinking of wider range, especially in the older children, just thinking of other systemic features like joint pain or rash. So where, what causes idiopathic nephrotic syndrome? And this is something that um, continues to baffle us. We don't know exact causes. And um, there's probably more than one and they're probably quite intertwined as that um, nice uh, 
small shows. And there is a, um, certainly an immune factor to it. And we know that purely because of all our medications we use target the immune system. None of them particularly target, we think, the kidney itself. Um, there's certainly proof that there is some sort of circulating. Certainly we found some things that got it syndrome in childhood, ones that um, especially target the nephron or the podocin. But some of this is entwined, and we're learning every day about, especially as the immune system. Um, and this is kind of being unraveled, and we've kind of worked backwards with the idiopathic and across the because we've got the what works well with them and what um, treats them very well before we really understood um, what causes it very well. Sorry, Hazel, I'm just going to quickly interrupt. Um, it's really hard to hear. Can everyone just make sure they've muted their mics, please? Um, I know it's really difficult with kids at home and things, but can you just make sure that you're muted so we can all hear Hazel? Thanks. Thank you. Hazel, you're muted. So when we've got a child that's presenting with nephrotic syndrome, um, I just want you to have a quick think about what would your management goals be? What are we trying to achieve with this child that we've got in front of us? Um, we've ruled out all the atypical things. We've got a child with, we think is idiopathic nephrotic syndrome. What are our immediate management goals? What are our kind of longer term management goals? I'll give you just a few minutes to have a quick think and type. It's like a test to see how well you can type quickly. <laughs> yeah, so probably the first one um, is that achievement remission. That's our first aim. We want to achieve that admission. We want to stop that protein um, from leaking. That's probably the number one um, management goal we have for any of our kids is to achieve remission. And then thinking more long term, um, especially in that acute phase where you've got a nephrotic child, it's looking at um, possible complications that can occur because of that nephrotic state, um, recognising them, preventing them, um, and treating any of those acute complications. And we'll think a little bit more about them, but I'm thinking specifically about infection, thrombosis, and hypovolemia. Um, and then thinking more long term, um, and especially if the kids are using steroids for repeat re um, relapses, looking at avoiding long-term complications of steroid use. Um, if you didn't know what they were. No, no. Um, just, I'm gonna put this here, I didn't know where to put it actually, but it's just a big bugbear of mine actually, it's what language we use to describe nephrotic syndrome, especially the language we use with um, parents. And there's loads of ways that you will hear that um, we classify idiopathic nephrotic syndrome. So very quickly, um, type in some of the ways we classify or how we classify nephrotic syndrome or how you've heard it or how you've described it to parents before, perhaps. Yeah, actually, um, the first one you've all um, come to is uh, the steroid. My response to steroid is probably our most classical one now is um, we describe it in terms of being steroid, uh, steroid sensitive or steroid resistant if they're not um, responding at all or even dependent where they do respond to prednisolone but can't come off prednisolone. There are other ways, though, um, definitely by relapses, so that infrequent relapser or the frequent relapser we definitely use. Um, the one that I don't like so much um, is by histology, and I still hear parents describing it as minimal change, and I do blame the internet more than anything. Um, the problem with using histology is you have to have a biopsy to use histology terms. We assume that people that respond to prednisolone are minimal change, we use that term. However, without biopsy, you cannot prove that. Um, so we shouldn't be using histology terms if we haven't done a biopsy, but we very rarely do biopsies um, for the vast majority of children with idiopathic nephrotic syndrome. 
because mostly they're not needed. Um, we'll come back to that later. So, got child, they're on their first presentation. We've gone through the typical, uh, actually, the typical features of presentation. I think it might take too long to try and do this on chat. Um, we've gone through some of the atypical ones, but the very typical story I hear from parents is that um, they've noticed a bit of puffy eyes, and very typically they've gone to the GP first. The GP has said it's allergies. Um, they get sent away with Pyroton, the Pyroton doesn't help, they go back, eyes are still swollen. Sometimes they get diagnosed as having sinusitis as well, um, but generally at some point, the notice that edema has gone from just being puffy eyes to being quite puffy everywhere, they end up going to A&E out of frustration and someone dips their urine. That's a typical one, obviously, some GPs are very on it and do um, look for other causes. But And then it's thinking about, um, so you've got a child that um, you know has three plus of protein, um, but what do we need to know next? Um, and it's thinking about what investigations are going to help us at this point, what observations are going to help us. So in terms of investigations, um, definitely those blood tests that will help you determine their renal function, um, their serum albumin. Yeah, definitely the um, complaint of frothy urine um, you have to have very honest parents who have realised that, but some of them very much do. Um, so thinking about your blood test, you might want to look um, more broadly if there's any other causes, the vasculitic one, you definitely want to be asking about is there any systemic illnesses going on, are they well, are they unwell at that point, have they got anything leading up to it, are there other signs of infection, are there other signs of clot, and we've had some it's very rare, but we've had some nephrotic syndrome that have been picked up because they presented with severe peritonitis septus, for example, or as a um, the cerebral clot, and it's been picked up almost backwards because they've got the um, side effect of the nephrosis before they've actually picked up on the nephrotic syndrome. And probably the most important thing, what treatment? So we've established it's probably an idiopathic and going to use the most general one. So it's an idiopathic nephrotic syndrome. We don't think there's any other atypical causes. What are we going to treat this child with? You should all be able to type this in about five seconds, I think. What's our mainstay treatment for any child with idiopathic nephrotic syndrome? Yeah, you got that. So prednisolone, it is our mainstay. It's been our mainstay now since uh, decades. Uh, and it, the reason is it because it works incredibly well for the vast majority of our children. Um, our usual dose, and I'll come on to it in a minute, is 60 milligrams per meter squared. Um, and we give it for four weeks. Um, regardless of whether they respond in the first two days or the first two weeks, they all get four weeks of high dose steroids. And this is a, a treatment that's harked back many, many decades now. Um, Prednos uh, 1, um, which is a massive multicenter. Uh, trial looking at the ideal dose of prednisolone didn't really look at whether we give the 60 milligrams per meter squared for four weeks and whether that works, um, sorry, it works, whether you, you can get away with using less. What it looked at was actually the weaning part of it and how long do you wean for. And it used to be that a lot of people gave long weans off this high dose prednisolone because there were some studies that suggested it kept you in remission for longer. And then other, um, this prednos study compared two weans, the short wean, the longer wean, um, and it suggested there was no difference in terms of long-term follow-up, in terms of how many relapses they had. So now, um, from Great Omistry, if you use our um, guidelines, we recommend the four weeks of high dose, 60 milligram per meter squared prednisolone, max dose of 60, and then we do four weeks of alternate day at 40 milligrams per meter squared, um, and then we stop it. And that's their first presentation. What you tell parents? Um, not going to dwell too much on this, it's quite hard to do without being able to interact with you guys. Um, but just think about um, what you're telling parents, how you're telling them they're leaking the protein, don't stop the medication suddenly is a really important one. And the one thing I would say is pre-warn the parents about the medicine you're about to give them, because prednisolone is not a walk in the park for a lot of families. It will cause their lovely placid child to get angry and have certain temper tantrums that the parents are not used to. It might cause them not to sleep properly. Um, it might cause them to have very extremes of emotions. Um, so 
do warn the parents in advance, yes, this prednisolone is going to help their necrotic syndrome in all likelihood. That 90% of kids will respond within those four weeks. But do warn them it's not necessarily going to be easy for them. It will change their behaviour. And that's probably the one um, that parents need to know about. The other red flag is um, about infection. Um, so always, if while they're on the high dose steroids and for that four week of weaning, they need to know that if the child is unwell, if they've got a fever especially, they should be presenting quickly um, for observation. There are some other medications that you might um, come across being used, some very um, typical ones. So as well as the prednisolone, what other medications have you seen used as that first line treatment for management of necrotic syndrome? Not necessarily as a first line, I don't think it's like a Definitely it's a steroid sperm. So you've got the prednisolone, um, Oh, there we are. There's just 60 milligrams for me to spend. Um, so I'm thinking more antibiotics. So usually if I do this presentation, someone says, what about antibiotics? And anyone that's used our guidelines will notice that it's not in our guidelines anymore um, for various reasons. One um, being the evidence behind giving it is quite poor. Um, so we know that infection is definitely a known risk in the prostate syndrome for various reasons. You've got a child that's puffy, got a load of water, they're losing their IgGs, they've got skin breakdown. Um, and when antibiotics were first introduced and they beat the introduction of prednisolone, there was a significant reduction in mortality um, in children with nephrotic syndrome. So everyone thought antibiotics were amazing. It dropped the mortality, excuse me, so much. Um, then prednisolone came along and the mortality should drop below 1%. And probably if prednisolone had come along first, it would have had such a significant effect. Antibiotics might not have got so established and traditional. Um, but the prednisolone is the most important thing. Antibiotics, um, possibly less so. Um, one of the things is um, which antibiotic do you give? So uh, PEN-V is our traditional one, but all, there's loads of infections that occur that don't um, respond to PEN-V or PEN-V won't stop. Also, adherence is a real problem. If you've ever had a, a two, three, four-year-old and you're convincing them to take prednisolone, prednisolone does not taste that nice. If you then say that you've also got to take this PEN-V, which also doesn't taste very nice, you can be onto a losing battle. So fight, get those medicines that you know is going to really help in the long term in. Um, rather than the one that's got less of a um, evidence base behind it. That being said, it, you should have a very low threshold for treating infection. It is a very much known uh, risk factor for someone with necrotic syndrome and someone on high dose prednisolone. Um, someone's uh, pointed out the other one that's really important is the oh, yeah. <laughs> gastric protection. Um, we do still use gastric protection, um, especially when they're in high dose. It used to be ranitidine and then um, they withdrew ranitidine. So now we're using lanzoprazole generally. And it can be very useful. Um, it can protect, obviously, the gut against high dose prednisolone, especially if you can't guarantee they take it with food. So that frosty toddler that won't eat when you want them to eat and you know you need to get prednisolone into them. Um, it can just help their um, protection that way. If they've had a history of um, problems, definitely they should be using it. Um, some countries still use thrombosis prevention um, routinely. I don't know that um, the UK ever has done um, routinely, um, but there should be some thought, just um, one, because it's a very um, recognised um, side effect from being nephrotic is um, you've got a higher state of higher risk of um, having a clot. Um, but um, the evidence suggests that actually the use of uh, prophylactic from both uh, pro <laughs> prophylactic anticoagulant um, causes more harm than it does prevent um, clots. So we don't tend to use them for all patients, but definitely if you've got um, a high risk, so if you've got a, a repeat frequent relapser who has had a history of clot, most of them will be on um, prophylaxis for their relapses. And also um, some of our kids that have got central lines for various reasons and have got high platelet count we do use in that situation. Um, but always it should be on your uh, mind if you've got um, by, uh, 
unilateral leg pain, um, if you've got frequent headaches we've had recently, the fit, um, etc. Um, it doesn't happen very often, but it's one to be very aware of. Um, so that's your first presentation. Um, so thinking about the prednisone, four weeks of high dose, four weeks of weaning. Um, no antibiotics, but definitely we still uh, recommend gut protection. Um, someone's asked about calcium and vitamin D. I know some countries do. Um, probably vitamin D is um, we're all insufficient in vitamin D at the moment because none of us are allowed outside. Um, but we don't recommend it usually, um, but it's, it's not going to be any harm in the child being on vitamin D. Any under five should be on vitamin D um, anyway. Um, but we don't routinely give them calcium. So just um, thinking about, so this is your first presentation, um, thinking more about the, the child that's coming back to you, the relapser, um, how do you manage relapses? And we recently um, thought, thought quite strongly about how do we actually recognize a relapse? And on the textbook, it's actually quite easy, isn't it? Three days of three plus, or three plus of protein with visible edema. Um, but there are some kids that don't um, fall into this nice three days of free plus, or they've got three days of free plus and actually have got many more days of free plus of protein, but they've got no visible sign of edema, they're not showing any other signs of being nephrotic. Or the one that causes me probably the most um, nightmares is the two plus. What do you do with the two plus? Um, and how long do you let them go on for? How long do you let that two plus protein go on for before you manage it? Um, do you manage it? Do you have to always step in with protein? There was an interesting little, really little article um, in one of the journals talking about um, when you leave protein, uh, kids that have got two plus protein in your ear and that some of them will sort themselves out. Um, some parents will let you wait. Um, some parents will very much not let you wait. Um, so some of it is going to be driven by what the parents, and it's the parents' um, history, it's the parents' um, history of what's happened before. So some parents, and I kind of get two camps of parents, you've got the parents that hate the prednisolone with all their might and will do anything to avoid the prednisolone because they know exactly what it does to their child, and then you've got the parent that um, hates relapses. They've had awful experiences with relapses, perhaps they've been in hospital, they've been so puffy, perhaps they've needed albumin, they'll do anything to avoid the relapses. Um, so you've got the ones that avoid the prednisolone that will phone you or present really late, um, perhaps when they know that they, there's going to be no other choice and it turns out they've been proteinuric for weeks. Um, and then the ones that hate the relapses that call you when they've got one plus of protein and want to start the steroid straight away because they want to avoid that three plus and the rest. How do we manage that? So if you've got a child that's got a known relapse, um, it's good to check for an individual relapse plan because there might be a consideration on there about how long you leave them for, etc. And the other things to consider is, is there a trigger? So we know viral illnesses are a very big trigger. Um, viral urtes in winter are probably our biggest one. About half of them will have a known trigger. And for a lot of children, they kind of get this um, very predictable cycle. They get a cough or cold, they get the protein, and they relapse. There's not going to be anything else but the prednisone for them. Um, whereas others, if it's a less obvious trigger, if um, or perhaps they've got over their cough and cold and it looks like it's trending down, you might be able to wait and see approach. Um, but parents, again, might be less or more willing to take that stand. And when do you start prednisolone? Um, and that sounds like a, an easy question sometimes, but do you treat a relapse early because perhaps you can use less prednisolone? Um, but if you treat too early, do you actually give them unnecessary prednisolone? If you waited the two, three, four days, will it have sorted itself out? Um, always think about their previous response to prednisolone and that's an important one because if they are really quick to respond to prednisolone perhaps it is safe to wait a few more days if they take forever to respond to prednisolone in the past it might be better to get in there before they become puffy but as i say parental choice will come into that a little bit so we now have two um plans for relapses um one of them is uh, 30 milligram per meter squared day, per day uh, treatment, so maximum dose of 30, so basically half of what we'd normally use 
Um, and then the second one is the 60 milligrams um, per meter squared. And the way we try and differentiate it, so I'm going between the screens, um, is to think about what that relapse is like. So if they are relapsing on paper, so they've got the protein, perhaps if you did a blood test, although you don't always need to do that, um, their albumin's dropped a little bit, but they're actually, they've got very little edema, they're very well with it, they've got an obvious trigger, so they've got a cough or cold going on, um, or they've had it in the past and they've responded very well to it. These are the ones we use the um, 30 milligram per meter squared per day on, and then we it as necessary. If they are unwell though, and especially if they're already puffy, if they've already got edema, um, the argument would be to use 60 milligrams um, straight away. And that's because once you're edematous on the outside, um, chances are your gut could be quite edematous and the, their response to prednisolone will be slowed by that delayed gastric um, absorption of prednisolone. So um, if they are already edematous, if they're unwell, the prednisolone, the higher dose of prednisolone is likely to work quicker and get you out of that um, cycle of edema, etc. So they're the ones that we would spare. We would go straight to the 60. So well, no edema or very little edema and no responder, try the 30. Already unwell or already edematous or you know doesn't respond to the low dose, go to the 60. Probably the um, bit that causes the most problems um, for anybody with the relapses is how do you manage the edema? And it's probably the bit that causes the most headaches at the end of the day. Um, and um, we understand edema to a certain extent, but we also understand that there's more than one uh, reason for the edema. Um, and that's perhaps the hardest thing is identifying um, the reason for it, but also how do you manage it? Um, and you could, um, one of the ways of classifying it is looking at um, the underfill versus the overfill theory of edema. So in the underfill um, theory, it's the one that a lot of us would have been taught years back. Um, it's the loss of the albumin causes the loss of the oncotic pressure, which causes the reduced vascular volume, which causes the retention of the sodium through the RAS system. Um, so you're underfilled, you, you prevent the hypervolemic, et cetera. But anyone that's looked after nephrotics will know that not all children that are puffy present underfilled. Not all of them will present um, with shutdown peripheries, etc., um, with uh, fast heart rate, etc. So then um, the thought was actually some of them are overfilled. Some of them have got too much water. And the theory goes that it's a primary sodium retention through the epithelial sodium channels that are found in the tubules that causes retention of water. So you absorb sodium or you retain sodium, you will retain water with it. Um, and that's that reduced permeability to water and salt in the glomerula. Therefore, you've got too much water everywhere and you want to. Um, and the treatment, um, if that's as true and as black and white as that, it's quite easy because if you've underfilled, you fill them up with, you want to restore their vascular volume with albumin. Um, and if you restore their vascular volume, you restore um, their ability, uh, they've got enough water there, they will start weeing and they will get rid of some of that or they will start diuresing. Um, if they're overfilled, you've got too much water there, you want to decrease that volume, you give them diuretics. So it seems quite easy on paper. Um, probably the first question you need to ask is actually, do you need to treat that edema? Um, for some, uh, the answer will be obvious and will be yes, if they're so overloaded, if they are hypervolemic, if they are already um, shocked, etc., you're going to be treating them. Um, but for some that are happily um, edematous, perhaps they've got puffy eyes, a bit about puffy ankles, there will be some that you can play the watch and wait and, and observe game. But I think that's the really important thing is actually to continue to observe them. So if you decided you're not going to do anything active, like diuretics, etc. you need to have a, um, a plan to continue to monitor them, whether it be the next day in your um, day unit, two days later with the community, and there needs to be some plan and some red flags. Probably the most important thing to always tell all these parents and all the families is to salt restrict. So both the underfill and the overfill come with a salt retention. So if you can um, dietary salt restrict, it can help them um, stop getting so much water retention. 
Um, how far you want to go with that, sometimes the parents will determine. And some parents like um, going to extremes and taking out every pinch of salt they possibly can. For some parents, that's just unrealistic. Um, so do it as realistically as you can. Um, cut out as much salt, cut out the obvious salt, don't add salt, etc. But um, think about the high salt. There's a very good uh, poster on the Action for Salt website that you can um, download and use. And it, it basically has a traffic light system. So you've got red foods, uh, amber foods, green foods. So green, you can as much as you like, red, avoid. And it's just a very good visual aid. Something like that can really help parents to, to know what to avoid. Um, and your next step is going to be that clinical review. You want to determine what that fluid status is currently. One thing I will say is you should never rely on a urinary sodium to help you determine. And that's because you'll get sodium retention from the tubules with both prior, um, with both the overfill and the underfill. So it won't be very helpful in necessarily telling you whether they've got a lot of fluid there or not. Blood tests um, can help you. And the HB could be high, tell you they're a bit underfilled. Um, perhaps they've got a AKI going on, which is a known risk of any child that's edematous, and it can help you identify that. For all of these kids, if they are in um, your ward, for example, they should all have a fluid balance going on, they should all have their ins and outs being measured, and at least a daily weight, because that weight changes, um, if you plot it in the morning, will help you determine, is that weight going drastically up? Is it quite static? Is it actually falling? And that possibly is better measurement than the fluid balance can be. We all quite like the fluid idea of fluid restriction um, because if you've got a load of water on board, why give more? Um, but just be really cautious with that because you can exacerbate an underfill, an underfill child, um, and you can definitely have a risk of an AKI. So always use fluid restriction with cautious. It should never be so restriction. And also, once the first thing they would do when they're starting to come out of a relapse before even the dipstick changes is they will start diuresing. Um, and that's the time you really don't want them um, to be on a fluid restriction. So always um, check, always be cautious with the fluid restriction. Probably bottom line, there's more than one cause of edema. Um, and they will change between those two. They will change between being over and underfilled quite frequently. Um, and that's where your observations and your recognition and that clinical observation will really help. And if you're doing things like giving them albumin or giving them diuretics, then you need to um, keep watching them, keep monitoring them carefully for those changes. This is just in a nutshell, um, those two ideas of the intravascular depletion, intravascular overload and how that works. You all probably can tell me all this already, so I won't dwell on it, but just looking at um, the different um, signs on clinical signs that you might find for the overfilled and underfilled. This came up as a, an idea of trying to um, have a simple pathway, recognising that it's not usually quite as simple as this makes out. Um, but it's looking at once you've done your observations, um, if you've got um, a good peripheral um, cat refill time, and they're intravascularly replete, um, they will probably cope with diuretics fine. Um, but if you've got peripheral cat refill that's starting to lengthen, if you've got signs that are a bit intravascularly dry, they might well benefit from a bit of albumin before you then diurese them, because then you'll have more chance of diurese and some extra fluid off. Um, if they're already shocked, straight to the, water, uh, straight to the fluid uh, resuscitations, the sodium chloride in that respect, if you can't get albumin. Um, you'd only ever give furosemide at that point if you've re-established a normal intravascular volume. But probably the most important thing is that reassessing their fluid status, reassessing it, reassessing it, because they can flip between those two quite frequently, quite quickly sometimes as well. So we looked at probably the most common um, problem we encounter with the nephrotic child. We've talked about how to manage that first presentation and those relapses. Um, but what about the longer term? Um, this is probably where they come to a tertiary clinic. Some, um, some of our um, spins look after them very well in the community on some of these, but generally once they're climbing up this steroid spare medications and um, they start coming through to a tertiary level. Um, 
And um, the idea of using steroid sparing medications is that prednisolone side effects. Um, and you've got the obvious short ones, so the behavior, uh, the insomnia, um, the weight gain, they're always hungry, it can cause acne, trying to convince any teenage girl to take, or teenage boy actually, I shouldn't be sexist, to take prednisolone is quite difficult at times because they know exactly what those side effects. Um, but also there's long-term problems of being on prednisolone and especially the growth, we don't want them to be short. Um, and we've got loads of things in our arsenal now, so um, we use um, sometimes all of these, sometimes one or two of these, and it will depend. And probably the one I've missed off um, is the prednisolone as a maintenance, so using low-dose prednisolone um, for long-term. And it's usually on an alternate day um, basis, so for example, a 5 milligrams on alternate day, 10 milligrams on alternate day. Um, and that can be enough just to keep them in remission. But it's really important if you've got them on long-term uh, prednisolone to monitor their growth carefully. Um, the Vamisole um, is probably one that you won't have heard of so much. Um, it's, it was initially used as a worm medicine and then in India it's found to be very good at keeping um, relapses away. Um, it's probably um, useful because it's an immune modulator rather than a suppressor. Um, it's quite a weak medicine. If it works, it works really well, but it's sometimes just not strong enough. Um, and we use it in combination with prednisolone off, often because that works better. Um, it works better in the South East Station, so the Indian, Pakistan, uh, Bangladeshi children seem to um, respond better to it than the white Caucasian children do. Um, if you've got a child though that is steroid dependent, if you've got a child that is relapsing on quite high dose of prednisolone, the Vamaso is very unlikely to work. And that's where we go for cyclophosphamide as our first line. Um, and we might be coming to you guys at a general level because um, the important thing on a cyclophosphamide course is they need a FBC monitoring at least every two weeks looking for neutropenia. The other ones um, are going more into long-term immunosuppressions and microphenolate um, using the calcineurin inhibitors, the tacrolimus, usually sometimes cyclosporin, but very rarely. Um, and then rituximab is probably our newest one in our arsenal. It's an infusion that we give here. It has to be given at a tertiary centre. Um, and it's our new one. It's probably one of our most effective ones along with tacrolimus but there's rules against when and where we can use it. And then we use combinations. Those kids that are so uh, nephrotic that they relapse as soon as you try and take away some of those prednisolone or they're relapsing on mycophenolate and combination with tacrolimus or they failed rituximab. Some of them are on combination of all of them. So some of them can be highly immunosuppressed just to get some control of the nephrotic syndrome. So then I'll come back to the biopsy. Um, when do we biopsy? Um, anyone got any ideas of when we biopsy um, children with nephrotic syndrome? Or who we might want to biopsy? Yeah, atypical presentation, definitely. That's probably the most uh, usual reason is the steroid resistant necrotic. So any kid that's got a steroid resistant necrotic syndrome, um, they probably buy themselves a biopsy. If they've got macroscopic hematuria and you're not sure what's going on, probably they will biopsy before treat with steroids. Um, but yeah, the steroid resistant ones. Um, the reason we don't biopsy now very much with the children that do respond to prednisolone is we recognize their response to prednisolone is more prognostic than the biopsy is the reason to biopsy is to look for that um, focal segmental glomerular sclerosis, the FSGS, or looking for other causes of that nephrotic syndrome that might not be so obvious. So we had a, um, a child that did actually respond initially to prednisolone, um, but then the response kind of got less and less obvious over time. Um, when we biopsied him in the end, he actually had what looked like a lupus type um, vascular um, changes going on which completely changed our management, obviously, but it's quite a rare one. Um, one of the reasons is it's not very prognostic. So we've got children with FSGS, um, so it's obvious scarring on biopsy that will respond to steroids or have responded to other medications like tacrolimus. 
Um, we've got children that on biopsy have minimal change, so they haven't found any scarred lesions, but they still haven't responded to anything. Um, just to address some of the others that are being suggested, we don't tend to biopsy if they're starting steroid sparing agents, but we sometimes do um, if they've been on long-term C and I, we can't get them off it. Um, if they've got a genetic cause, we wouldn't biopsy if you've got a known genetic cause because it doesn't add anything to it. Um, if they present early before the age of one, potentially we could do, um, nowadays are more likely to send off their genetics and try steroid depending on their age, um, but we'd wait for a genetic result before biopsying generally. Um, the younger you are, the more likely you are to have a genetic. So if you're less than three months and you've got a congenital necrotic syndrome, um, you've got 90% chance of having a known genetic and they, we very, very rarely biopsy anyone, any congenital now. Between the three and the 12 month, uh, so the infantile nephrotic syndrome, um, slightly more gray area. Um, the closer you are to the three month, uh, the more likely you are to have the genetic, the closer you are to one, the more likely you are to respond to prednisolone and not have a genetic cause. So it does depend on age. And we might try um, prednisolone if they're say 10 month, 11 month old, um, rather than biopsying, but it will depend on other other features as well, if there's any other atypical features, for example. Just some other things to think about. Um, vaccinations, really important. Obviously, they can't have live vaccines if they're on uh, prednisolone, high-dose prednisolone or immunosuppression, um, but they should have all their other childhood vaccinations. Um, just be aware, because it is a known trigger for relapse, so if they're on steroid, um, it's probably best not to give it when they're on full-dose steroids, but you can give it when they're weaning prednisolone. And that could just um, prevent a relapse from happening. Um, if they haven't had the, the PCV, so the um, pneumococcal the 23 variant one, they should have it if they're over two. Um, so they've all had the PPV, but they should all have the PCV. We do recommend the flu vaccine. We recommend the injection rather than the nasal spray for most of ours. Um, although if they can have live vaccines, there's no reason for them not to have the nasal spray. Um, but again, just be aware that it is uh, a trigger, can be a trigger for relapses. So if they're on steroids, if they're on maintenance prednisolone, sometimes what we do is give them, um, so if they're on the alternate day, we might give them three days of their usual dose of prednisolone. So say they're on five alternate day, we might give them five daily for three days just to try and um, prevent that from happening. Probably the big thing we, well actually COVID-19 is a big thing at the moment, isn't it? But chickenpox was usually one of my biggest reasons for calls. Um, and it's contact, none of them are having contact at the moment. It's been lovely because no one's seen anyone, um, but it's all about to start again. If they have had a known contact, to, uh, so all children that present with nephrotic syndrome should have their chickenpox antibody status checked and the parents should know whether they are at risk of it or not. Um, if they have a contact and they're not immune um, and they're on high dose prednisolone or they've been on high dose prednisolone within the last three months or they're on immunosuppression or within the last three months, um, then they should have, um, I think it's still acyclovir at the moment because there's no VZIG, um, but anything, what the green book says, um, should go through the significant exposure. If they've got signs of actually having chickenpox, they should be treated um, with IV acyclovir for at least the first 48 hours um, and then managed with or, or acyclovir if they're well um, enough to go home. Um, but just be aware that any... Um, Any infection is a known risk of relapse and some of the harder ones are when you've got a, a quite a sick uh, child with chicken pox and they've relapsed um, and trying to manage that with prednisolone is quite tricky. So I'm going to try and run this case study. I apologise if it doesn't work very well. Um, so you're going to meet for, uh, Ted um, and you're in A&E with him um, and parents have taken him to the GP Said it's quite a usual one, puffy eyes. Um, when you see him, um, you're seeing him in the evening, so he actually has quite minimal periorbital edema. Um, his history is a well child, he's vaccinated. Um, he's had puffy eyes perhaps a month, um, but it has been getting worse. And now parents have noticed the socks are leaving quite big indents in his legs. Um, when you see him, you've assessed him as having quite marked edema to his tibia, he's got ascites, um, he's got a bit of mild 
abdominal pain as much as a three-year-old will tell you, but everything else is pretty stable. Um, I'm going to leave the impression because if any of you answers anything but the faucet syndrome, you probably haven't been paying attention. Um, probably what the test and what next steps, what test might you do, what test might help you at this point? Year in depth, definitely. It's going to rule in, roll out the prostate syndrome straight away. Um, UNE definitely will help you. You want to know what their renal function is doing. You want to know what their serum albumin is doing, definitely. That will all help to drive that um, diagnosis, but also um, prove it's typical or not typical. Um, rule out infection, definitely. You want to know they're not sick before you start all the steroids. Yeah, definitely want to check the chicken pot status. Electrolytes, definitely, I'm not sure what KFT, but I'm going to guess kidney function test, which, yeah, you're going to know what their kidney function is like. Um, so these are what's coming back from what you've asked for. So four plus protein, two plus blood. Um, that's his UNE, so not too exciting. His, you'll almost always get a bit of a high urea going. Um, Albumin and 19. Um, and his sit-up is less than two, which will help you rule out an infection. His urine is sodium, because someone said it was less than 10. Um, I'm going to skip the diagnosis and the cause, if any of you said nephrotic syndrome. Um, we've talked quite a lot about atypical features, but so treatment-wise, we're going to give him 60 milligrams per meter squared of prednisolone, but I'm interested in what are you going to do with this child next? So he's in A&E, you've diagnosed him with idiopathic nephrotic syndrome. Um, I'm going to rule out any of the other atypical is a very typical age presentation. Um, what are you going to do with him though? Where's he going to go next from A&E? Seven o'clock at night on. What would you do with him? So what a follow up? Someone said give Pred and plan for follow up on the what follow up do you want to do? Definitely a daily urine dip. So you want to be teaching the parents how to do that um, daily urine dip. You want to tell them to do the first one in the morning as much as you can get a three year old to do it first thing in the morning. And you want to um, give parents a chart, some sort of chart. There's one on Great Ormond Street you can download for them, make your own. Um, but you want the parents to be charting their results for you so that when you do look back, you can see exactly how their response has been. A weight would be very helpful, definitely. Blood pressure, I'll probably skipped over that one. Um, probably evening one, that I would say admit them. Um, you've got a three-year-old that you're about to start prednisolone. It's a well child, might not have had medication. You might just want to get a feel for them. If you're not going to admit them, at least plan for them coming back for a few days. So you can see them, you can eyeball them, you can see that they're taking the prednisolone, they're coping with that prednisolone that the adherence is there, that parents are coping with dipping their urine. Um, you can check their weight daily then, make sure they're not piling on that edema or um, the opposite, make sure that they're going to lose some of this water. Um, so if you're not admitting, have a very good follow-up plan. Some places use their community net, they use the community nurses, have a very good community nurse service that can uh, provide that in their own home. Some haven't got that resource, so um, we'll bring them back to their own day units, etc. But if you're not going to admit them, have a very good follow-up plan. And that goes for this new diagnosis and it goes for following up relapses as well. I've had quite a few kids that haven't been given much of a follow-up plan. Um, when, uh, when do you want to see them again? Always plan to see them again because you can always phone and say, look, you've gone into a mission and don't need to be seen. But have some sort of follow-up plan to make sure that um, they're going into a mission or, and also that they're not getting so edematous that you need to do something about it. So you have admitted him, he's on oral prednisone, doesn't like the taste, it's very typical. He's eating a bacon sandwich. Um, and when you examine him, you're now on the ward, uh, he's got a bit cool peripheries, um, his weight's gone up by a kilo, um, got a positive balance, but probably not very inaccurate because the three doesn't like green in the pot. 
um, but he does look puffier. Um, what might you be thinking at this point? And what actions might you be thinking about taking? Yeah, you might be thinking, what's going on with that tummy pain? What's causing that? Definitely, you might want to do a blood pressure differently. Peritonitis is always one you should have at the back of your mind, especially if they've got tummy pain um, and you've got cold peripheries, shut down peripheries. Um, but it is afebrile with it. Um, so, but always, always consider thrombosis, always consider infection, definitely. Um, I agree, I think he's a bit dehydrated and probably needs some volume. Um, and discussion about IV albumin might help, might consider, might bring that intravascular volume back up. Um, so you have given him some fluid, you gave him some albumin um, and you go back to see him the next morning and he's not slept very well, he's quite grumpy. Um, but when you examine him, he's got nice warm peripheries, his cat refill is less than two, his weight is still going up though, his blood pressure is quite generous for a three-year-old. Um, and he's obviously still puffy, still got high protein. No one's done any bloods because nobody asked for any. Um, what might you be considering now? Yeah, I never actually thought of that. You've got a grumpy child. Um, is there actually something going on in their brain? Always think from basis, definitely. You might want to discuss it with a tertiary centre. If you discuss it with the tertiary centre, have a good, um, have all this information, but also have their fluid balance and their weight. And um, it's really helpful to know that um, before. It's quite a classic. You'll get the swinging from where they're quite cool and shut down, that underfill. You fill them up with albumin, now they're nice and filled. Um, and you could consider giving them a bit of diuretic just to help them, so a bit of furosemide, um, they're nice and warm, you know their weight's up, you know their blood pressure will cope with it because their blood pressure's um, quite good and it might just get some of that water off them. Uh, so you're on the evening round, um, you're called by a worried nurse and um, Ted's been in a negative balance, they've done very good monitoring, his weight is down at uh, half a kilo since that morning, he's not drunk very much, um, and that nurse has very stereotypical nurse. She would like to start IV fluids. Um, now, rather than waiting for the overnight, his urinalysis is the same. What might be going through your head at this point? You might want to go and examine him. Maybe okay, yeah. Well, those passing good amounts of urine without really drinking. So one of the first things that you'll get um, when they're starting to respond to prednisolone, they will have no change on their urinalysis at all. They will still be dipping full plus. The first thing that will change is that they diurese without you doing anything. Um, so if he's not thirsty, he's not, not got anything driving his um, thirst going on, his body is getting rid of that water. So his weight is starting to come down. It's usually one of the first signs that actually coming out of a um, out of the relapse. So if they're lovely and warm and well perfused, um, you haven't got any concerns about their intravascular state, they're nice and um, you're, uh, you're, can't remember the word, you're bulimic. Um, it could well be that he's just starting to respond to the prednisolone and some do respond that quickly. I wouldn't start IV fluids anyway. You can always get him to drink. Um, just a quick sideline, if you did need to use IV fluids and you've got a nephrotic who's in a relapse, what kind of fluids would you use or would you perhaps avoid? So no, I'd just be very careful using uh, saline or the 4.5% saline. Um, if you've got it, you could use, uh, you can use albumin, 4.5% albumin as um, IV fluids. 
it is fine to use it. Um, you can just use glucose, but if you've got someone on high dose steroids, probably not a good thing. So I would always say um, use oral fluids if you can. But yeah, it's always just be aware of what fluid you're using, how much salt you're giving them. So Ted is in remission. I just wanted to point out, I'm not suggesting that he has to be an inpatient until he goes into remission. Um, but he's been discharged, he's gone very quickly. Um, so you all know what happens with the prednisolone, hopefully now, we carry on with that for the four weeks anyway. Um, but again, thinking about what follow-up arrangements you need, um, have that follow-up plan in place, let the parents know who they should be talking to and when. Um, so you've got a negative urine, when do you want to hear um, if that urine changes? Um, what red flags do you want to give them in terms of infection? Uh, perhaps chicken pox, uh, perhaps going back to school, um, when can they go back to nursery? Um, and think about what parents need to be able to do at home. So giving the medications, um, not stopping them abruptly, um, talking to you if they're really struggling giving medications, um, dipping their urine, how to read that dip. So dip it in, out really fast, wait for the minute, whatever it is, um, before they read it. Um, that will help and make sure they're writing it down as well so that you've, they've got the records, they get used to making those records because they're very helpful in long term. Just quickly, just to finish off, this is nine months later, he's in A&E. Um, his mum's been checking the urine, it's still four plus, but it was, she's only checked it that morning. Last week it was negative. He had a relapse two months ago and he's just come off the prednisolone from that wean three days. Um, he's a bit of debitus, but he's clinically well. Um, just thinking about the long term, does that change how you classify his necrotic syndrome? Um, and what are the, uh, how would you manage this? Yeah, we classify him as steroid dependent. Well, officially you have to have two relapses within two weeks of stopping prednisolone, but it would definitely be think, swaying your thinking towards him being steroid dependent. And then thinking as well as managing this relapse, you have to manage this relapse anyway, with the prednisolone is thinking, what do you do when you, wean, when you wean off that prednisolone afterwards? And it could be this is the time to um, make a tertiary referral. It could be that this is the time to think about maintenance prednisolone, keeping him on long-term prednisolone. Um, and all thinking, but thinking about it now while you're treating the relapse before you get to the point of having to wing off again. Um, so there's just a few re references for you. Hopefully I haven't gone on too long for you this evening. Um, that's just uh, to do the servo monkey. Um, give some feedback, that'd be great for me because I've got to do my um, NMC re-evaluation. So this is all very helpful for me. Um, but thank you for listening and thank you for joining on the chat. It's um, never done it before, so you made it easy. So thank you very much. Anyone got any last minute questions for me before you all run off for your dinner? Thank you. Uh, that's an interesting one. Someone's asked, uh, would you use prophylactic antibiotics for NSF? It's probably the one we have an argument about. Um, I would still, um, if you've got a steroid dependent child or steroid sensitive child, sorry, that you can use prednisolone for, uh, I wouldn't necessarily jump to the antibiotics unless you've got a lovely reason to think about it, but I would have a very, very low threshold for starting them. If you, if you have had to start antibiotic prophylaxis, you only need to have them when they're still necrotic. So as soon as they're going into remission, you can stop them. Actually, as soon as they're not a demeter, you can stop them. That's a big risk. Thank you.
You're Use of almond infusions with frisomide is a, a talk all by itself. Not one I can cover in a few minutes. But we do, we use albumin infusions, we use 4.5%, we use 20% if we need to, if the, if the edema is proven difficult to treat, etc. We do definitely use it. But we tend to only use 20% albumin in a tertiary centre because of the monitoring we would request for it. <clears throat> 